Wow, it's a lot more empty in here than it was a few minutes ago. So that's good for us. Brothers, sisters, distinguished guests, good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank my co-moderator, who I'll uh, bring up in just a minute, and the panelists for taking the time out of their data to sit up here and for a grueling 75 minutes. So this year, as we're putting our, our panels together, we definitely decided we wanted to talk about weather. And we threw a, a, around a couple of different ideas and settled on what we're going to talk about today. And, and I don't think we've done this at CFS that I recall. So what we're going to have up here is a view from the operations. We have an en route uh, TMC. We have someone from the command center. We have safety reporting experts from both ATC and the pilots and the dispatch, the dispatch side of the airlines. So uh, as a reminder, we will be using the app for questions. So please drive those questions to us. So the NASA Airspace System is a complex set of systems, procedures, facilities, aircraft, and people that create an environment for the safe operation for all types of aircraft throughout the country. Depending on what report you read, weather's a factor in 50 to 60 percent of delays in the NAS. I've also heard people state that 80 to 85 percent of delays in the Northeast Corridor are weather related. And we also know that in both commercial and general aviation, weather related factors are among the top five re reasons for aircraft accidents and incidents. We know that once weather starts, it's going to have a ripple effect through the NAS. And weather, weather impacts can vary, right? Could, depending on the time of the year and the location. Could be convective weather, thunderstorm season. Could be icing low visibility throughout many parts of the country in the winter months. High winds, moderate severe turbulence, and so on. So in listening to that last panel, I thought they were pretty funny, and I don't think this panel is going to be funny. <laughs> uh, but, and also in our discussions, we're wondering how to bring training into this, to this discussion. So just remind me of a quick story. Years ago, I was on a FAM trip, Northwest Airlines 757 from Seattle to Minneapolis. And I get in there, and the guy goes, ah, you're a center controller. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm our chief pilot on weather. And you center people who don't know anything about weather. He goes, what do you know about weather? I said, I know how to read it. That's about all I know about it. So for that three-hour trip to Minneapolis, trust me, he schooled me, he taught me, Seemed like he was yelling at me. But honestly, I did learn something. So we can always take learning, all right? And that was just, uh, just popped into my head. So today, we're going to spend some time discussing weather, uh, technologies, how things work, maybe some things that don't work. And uh, we look forward to the next hour. So with uh, no further ado, the ATO Director of Safety, my co-moderator, Tony Schneider. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here at CFS, and, and I really want to thank all the people that uh, made this great event happen. I also want to thank Jim and the panel uh, for all the work they've done so far, and also to thank you for the amazing work that you do every day, ensuring that the NAS uh, runs safely and efficiently. Um, a friend of mine from Fort Worth Center sent me a quote this morning, and it kind of brought this all home for me. It was from Vince Lombardi, and um, the quote goes along the lines of, Achievements of an organization are the results of the combined effort of each individual. That couldn't be more true than during a severe weather event. Um, the work that you do soliciting and disseminating PIREPs, issuing, issuing depicted precipitation, approving weather deviation, all while ensuring separation is why the U.S. public enjoys the safest aviation transportation system in the world. Today I'm really excited uh, to hear more from our panel on how it, that's all going to come together and suggestions on how we can move forward uh, to improve the overall system performance during our severe weather events. Uh, right. Jim Thanks, back. Tony. All right, no further ado, let's bring up our panelists. First off is Jessica Straley. She's from the command center and a NACA member. We have uh, Mr. Dave Cook, air traffic controller, Jackson Center, also ATSAP ERC for NACA. Gerald Quayle, Air Traffic Controller, Facility Representative, JFK. Ben Dengler, Traffic Management Coordinator, Washington Center. Rachel Ray, ASAP Representative for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local 357, and a pilot for Republic Airways. And Mike Sterenchuk, American Airlines Flight Dispatch, ATC Coordinator. So let's give them a welcome to the stage, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's start by trying to paint a picture of how our system works, right? When it's determined whether it's gonna have an impact. So let's start with Jess, if you don't mind. Uh, if you can help us walk through, let's say in this case, it's clear very early in the day, major convective activity is developing in the central US is going to build and move east 
and start, start talking. Okay. So basically, it starts off with our day very early in the morning. We look at a lot of different models of weather to see what is going to be the problem areas for the day or the areas of concern. A lot of conversations with the meteorologist to see what it's going to be. Um, basically, if you want to do like a football analogy, it's kind of like we're the offensive and defensive coordinators of where we're going to put the airplanes to get them through the weather systems that are out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at transcon routes first. We try to put them in, so a transcontinental route, we try to put them in somewhere where there's going to be clear, clean air, so it's avoiding the weather and putting them out of the way to kind of thin out the volume in the areas that have the problems. Um, when we look at those transcontinental routes, remember it's going to be about a five-hour flight time across the country to get there. And the complexity that's out there for the controllers, if we don't put them somewhere that's out of the way, is a long flight plan to change. Maybe the fuel's not available for the airplane to be able to take a change in the flight plan if we try to do it once they're airborne. So we have to look very far ahead of time to figure out where we need to put those planes to get them handled at the base level at the ground before they take off. So we take care of those transcons, put them in good routes. When we do that, we're also taking consideration the transcon push that's going to come the opposite direction later because we don't want to tie our hands as that weather moves and put all of our flights in one spot and need to use the same airspace the other direction later. So we try to separate those and come up with a good plan. We look at if we need to use Canadian airspace for a can route option because we have to call and coordinate with them to figure out if that's something that we want to do to kind of mitigate the risk of volume. Once we've got a plan figured out for those transcontinental flights, we're also looking at the problem areas where we may have to use secondary routes out there to take care of volume concerns that we've created by putting all the planes in certain spots. Maybe we need a secondary route to thin that area out a little bit. We'll look at regional routes to adjust that. And we'll look at the major traffic flows to our major airports. So as that weather pushes through, is it, if it's in the Midwest, is it going to hit Chicago? When is it going to hit Chicago? We'll start determining what route structure we need for the flows of traffic for that, what kind of ground delay programs we need. Is it going to push through and be a problem for the traffic flows into other areas that we have, Minneapolis Airport as well, or Atlanta. So we'll take a look at those and we'll develop a strategy for either ground delay programs to help to slow the volume down with edicts, route structure of how to get them in when they're constrained, they maybe lose this northeast gate and they're only going to go in a certain way. So we have what are called playbooks that are pre-coordinated routes through all the facilities to figure out where to put these so that it's a flow that you're already familiar with that you do see. We try to stick with that so you don't get something that's new that you aren't used to and we develop a general strategy. We coordinate with the facilities that are impacted to see if they're on board or if they have issues or concerns that we haven't taken into consideration. They're directly involved in collaborating and deciding what we're going to do there. Then we're going to publish out the advisories. And there are some days that the weather systems are all over. There is no such thing as clear airspace, so we're looking for what's the most permeable airspace to put a lot of these routes and set that up. And then we look at airspace flow programs as well, which is just to slow down with edicts just like we did with the GDP, but now it's over in airspace and take that into consideration. So we kind of set up a whole strategy of where we're going to move a lot of planes early so that we put them in a spot that is a workable position that the controllers are in so that we don't have a lot of complexity associated with deviations and volume and everybody coming at them. We don't sterilize the airspace, but we're moving big groups of volume out of the way to try to make it a workable situation. That's kind of what we do. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else? Ben, you want to take it from there if you're affected now? So, yeah, so when, uh, as Jessica said, it starts very early in the morning. Most of us start 4.30 or 5 a.m. If this is going to be a big impact, one of the things that will happen is like she's, it's a collaborative effort. So as they're developing these plans and getting their weather briefing, they're on the phone with all the affected centers. One of the big things that um, I'm going to look at when she's uh, coordinating with me is how is the impact on my center? But I'm also concerned about the impact on the NAS. How is it going to be impacted on Indy Center in Memphis and further going west? So we'll have a discussion on uh, maybe we're going to put a transcon playbook in, in effect, and I'm going to ask her how many airplanes are you going to reroute off of a normal route and route through Washington Center or route through Jacksonville Center or through Atlanta Center. And then we'll have a discussion on um, the impact of that. The one difficult thing that's very uh, challenging is to determine what the capacity is going to be when you have a weather impact. When you have a line of weather, it's fairly easy to predict and kind of move around it, but when you have that more sparse coverage, um, it's much more difficult to determine the impact on the NAS and the loss in capacity. So we try to balance that demand with capacity, and that is somewhat of a guessing game to uh, determine where that weather is and what the impact is. 
Um, one of the things, for instance, if there's a big line of weather that runs from Chicago down through Kansas, somewhere down like that, and they want to put transcons that'll come down through us, uh, they'll say, hey, we want to move the New York and the Boston market on one particular play. Uh, maybe we'll move the DC market on that same play. Or I'll look at it and say, you know, that's going to be a big impact on some of my departure sectors or some of my westbound flow sectors. So we'll have that discussion of maybe we could move the New York market to a particular flow and then the Washington and DC and the Philadelphia market to another flow. Um, I'm going to start looking at once those plays are in effect, uh, one of the first things I'm going to do is start telling everybody that needs to know. So I get a, we all call it general information message. I'm going to send a message out to all my towers, all my terminals, um, even the sectors on the floor that own an airplane, you know, to the ground, uh, that we can get those uh, reroutes going as soon as possible. So dispatchers can plan, and I can start planning on the impact to my sectors if I need to uh, put out other TMIs. Maybe I need some departure restrictions to slow down the added volume that's going into that particular piece of airspace. Um, perhaps some additional reroutes that we've put flows of airplanes into sectors that normally don't see that. Now I'm going to try to balance that a little bit, perhaps take a couple of flows out of those sectors and kind of share the wealth throughout the, uh, throughout the system a little bit. And like I said, when, once that happens, we, we talk um, collaboratively, and then I'm on the line with my uh, TRACONs and then my towers, and we get those folks moving as uh, quickly as we can. There are times, um, be a little frustrating for the users, I think, because uh, I'll get a call at 5.15 in the morning and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to put a route, route out for Texas. We're going to put a route out for the LA Basin. We just haven't been able to coordinate it all the way through yet because some of those folks out west haven't quite gotten into work yet. So I know it's coming. I will a lot of times tell the towers, it's like, hey, there's a reroute coming. You'll have to wait. Mm -hmm. I'll take, start taking a list of airplanes. So sometimes when you're trying to get moving in the morning, there may be a delay of 15 or 20 minutes because I don't have that route yet. It's not fully been coordinated, but I do know something's coming, and I'd rather keep you on the ground so you can get off on a good route completely, the fuel's planned for and everything else is planned for. So there are, sometimes there's, a, there's a, a, a break in that time frame, you know, that it's not right out of the gate in the morning. That's kind of what we, you know, that's a, a typical kind of mid-country mid scenario. Yeah. So Mike, now you roll into work. You got this set in front of you. What's it look like for you? Well, on my way to work, there's a number I can call if I'm not feeling well. <laughs> but <laughs> typically don't use that number. But uh, yeah, so, you know, we come into work and we're looking at what Jessica said, a day in the NAS with constraints in the national airspace system. And when you look at, uh, I represent American Airlines, but when you look at the other aviation entities out there, transportation system entities, you know, you've got the military, you've got general aviation, NBAA, you've got the other commercial carriers, um, you've got new uh, entrants, drones, things of that nature, as well as space. We all vie for one thing that's very important for our business to succeed, and that's the national airspace system. And fortunately, we have the best in the world because of you folks out there, and I commend you for your efforts. We have some things called customers, and on behalf of the customers, I want to tell you, they appreciate what you do, even though you may not hear it. So I just wanted to put that out there, but as we look at the day, we understand that if there's constraints, whether the good Lord gives us things we don't want to deal with and have challenging days to deal with, and I think the important part of that is to say, how can we work together safely? to manage the NAS to where the impact to the network, to my resources, my crews, my gates, my customers, um, my pilots, my flight attendants, aircraft routings. How do we mitigate the damage to our networks so that we have high completion rates, that we have few gate returns, we don't have any cancellations? That's the perfect world. It's not always achievable. But the best part is we collaborate and we communicate all day long through the strategic planning telecons to advise the command center what are our needs for the day? What, do we, what is important to us? Importance nowadays, everybody's flowing on airplanes. What's the load factor? 90, 92%? If your flight cancels, where do I send you? How do I get you to where you want to go? It's very difficult. So everybody else, I can't even give them away to one of my competitors and let you fly on them because their flights are full. So 
when we, we have our needs, we also understand that air traffic has their needs. Somehow we have to work together and meet in the middle to manage it the best we can and mitigate all those issues I just described. Yeah. So Rachel, you're flying that day. You do anything different? Well, every pilot's gonna <clears throat> come to work, get a general idea of what the weather's gonna be like for that day. So uh, if it's gonna be a day where there's gonna be a major weather system that we'll be dealing with, we just dealt with Hurricane Dorian, uh, that affected the East Coast. Uh, my airline is a big, uh, East Coast uh, area that we cover. Uh, we're going to come in prepared knowing that uh, reroutes are likely, uh, that uh, we'll be working with our dispatcher very closely on fuel planning and route planning and uh, just come prepared uh, with that mindset of, you know, with all of the uh, things could happen that day. So, uh, yeah, we'll definitely come in kind of mentally prepared for uh, being flexible because that's going to be the key for uh, dealing with those types of things. And of course, uh, pilots are uh, very acutely aware of <clears throat> the uh, constraints that air traffic control will be having that day based on the weather. And, um, and so, you know, it, we all feel very, uh, have a spirit of cooperation when we come in. We know in order to get the flights completed and completion factor is a big deal for all of us, like every pilot wants to complete the mission. That's just in their DNA. So we know we're going to come in and we're, we're going to work really closely with our partners in dispatch and on the air traffic control side. And uh, so, you know, you kind of come in prepared for all of us. We know we're going to have a tough day, but we're going to work together and we're going to get through it. Yeah. So, Gerald, now the weather's sitting in your place. What's, it, what's, your, what's your day look like? So as an air traffic controller in the New York area, first and foremost, similar to Mike, I'm looking to see if I have leave-in, and if not, it's probably going to be followed by a couple of expletives, but, you know, I've been in the agency for 10 years. I spent all of my time in New York, so I'm kind of used to convective activity and bad weather. So when we talk about bad weather, especially in the Northeast Corridor, we're talking about the Severe Weather Avoidance Program, SWAP. Um, it's a mixed bag, bag of good bad and sometimes what the fill in the expletive, um, you know, but we work through it specifically for JFK and our operation. You know, most uh, airports in the New York area this past summer has gone through um, a lot of runway construction. So we'll try to see if we can get on a runway configuration that favors a swap event, pull in some tactical uh, moves, whether it be, you know, add a secondary departure runway, make sure we have the staffing in place to be prepared. Timing is a big component when it comes to swap, depending on where we are in our shift. If it's during an arrival bank, we can pretty much mitigate the issues and have the arrivals come in. And if we have a, a traffic management initiative in place and there's a ground delay program, we can talk about numbers and what the arrival weight will look at while we're low on the departure side and adjust accordingly as we need to. But um, in terms of the weather, it's a New York thing, it's a Northeast Corridor thing, and we roll with the punches. Yeah. So I'm gonna, t I'm gonna pull the thread on this a little bit and take advantage and knock a question off our board, okay. or maybe even two. So uh, in SWAP, does the TRACON Center coordinate with the tower at all? How does that work when, you, when the SWAP is decided? So in SWAP, it's, uh, it's mostly automated coordination. We have the departure spacing tool that we use to coordinate between the TRACON and the uh, center. So by definition, when we go into a swap event, sliding clearances are avoided. So in a normal routine, in a normal course of a shift where uh, weather is not an impact or even a factor, New York Center gets the routes 45 minutes prior to the proposed departure time. The towers get it 30 minutes prior. So there's a 15 minute window for the in route New York Center to make a change if need be and pass it along to the tower. Now, when we go into a swap event, there's a depletion of routes available to get planes out of New York. And so they're basically looking at routes on a case-by-case -case basis. So what that involves is we don't know what's happening. Actually, I'll, I'll take that back. We do know what's happening, but sometimes communication may not be as clear, uh, clear as it needs to be. So as a plane is ready to taxi out, we advance them to the next stage of flight where they're actually taxiing to the departure runway. At that given point in time, that's when New York Center looks at the route. They'll either clear the mass foul on the route that they have, make a revision, 
or God forbid, no route available. And if it's no route available, JFK becomes a parking lot very quick. Yeah. Go ahead, Jessica. So um, just to address this a little bit differently as well. Um, so New York is unique because they have a departure sequencing program. And that's a silent communication he was talking about, the DSP, and they do it that way. At different facilities across the country, it's managed differently. So some of the centers out there will do the reroutes. They'll have you call for release from the towers. They might send you a GI message saying to call for release on all aircraft to going to this destination so they can check and they'll do the reroutes as the time goes on. So it, it depends on where you are across the country and the center and their inter, inter relationships with the facilities that underlie them going to the tracons and down to the towers. So that it kind of depends on that facility, how that works. Um, he definitely described how it works at New York, but I know that there's other facilities in the country where the traffic management unit at the center does the reroutes and they'll pass those to the towers or the tracons through automation systems and through call for releases, situations like that. Um, so I have the second question. Uh, it's around um, the theme <laughs> of this conference, right? Every day uh, is a training day. And so uh, from your perspective, and I'll throw this out to the panel, um, how does this uh, apply to weather? So in the tower, as every controller does in the NAS, we do our pre-duty weather briefing. Anyone who works in the New York area facility day, you pretty much know that two things you're looking for. If swap is probable for the day, and if it's uh, VFR in Bermuda, it's a New York thing, I guess, with the uh, oceanic sector in New York Center. So when we say every day is a training day, we uh, use that a lot in swap and bad weather situations because you want to be dynamic. You want to you know, fall back on what you know in terms of training and you know, moving aircraft, sequencing aircraft, so on and so forth. But at the same time, you don't want to rest on your laurels or be complacent and being like, OK, well, what happened yesterday is going to happen today because the weather is there. And so we're going to you know, play the same, use the same playbooks, tactics to get the job done. No, you, know, you, you get in the trenches, you work with your fellow controllers, your support teams, and you try to accomplish what you need to accomplish. So um, you know, we train during swap sessions. You know, only the strong survive in New York, I guess you can say, but we get through it. So I would add to that that basically, I mean, across the country, swap season is very, I mean, you guys have been through it. You've seen a very strong swap season this year, which is severe weather thunderstorms across the country, whether it's the dry line in spring coming across Albuquerque and through the desert, or all the flooding and rain and thunderstorms we've had in the Midwest or the Northeast Corridor. I mean, Cleveland and Washington, India have had a lot of thunderstorms this year that happened very early. So you guys have lived it. You have lived the outcome of the swap season. The training on that is very much on the job training. I mean, you guys know what that is. They, we do a lot of that throughout the time. The, top, the real secret is that every weather situation is unique. It changes. It changes in focus. A lot of how well we do really depends on how good that forecast is. And as I talked about transcontinental flights, we're doing those you know, we have to have that published. If it's a five-hour flight time, we need to give an hour preparation time for dispatchers to be able to read it and get the fuel on board and get the right flight plans out for, the, for all the other pilots. So that's six hours ahead of time that we're publishing, which means we're looking at it three hours before that trying to figure out where to put them. So if that forecast is not right on, then we might put airplanes in the wrong spot. So it's really the real secret is you can be a hero because the weather is in the right spot or a zero because it's not. Hero to zero and zero to hero based on the weather forecast is really what happens. And that's just how it works. It's mother nature that's winning this game every day. We're doing our best, like you said, with the training we have and the routes that we know work in those situations is what we're trying to apply. But some days it doesn't go exactly like we forecasted and it'll be a little bit different. And that's just how it works. I love that saying, there's only one letter difference between zero and hero, and the right. fall is pretty quick. So um, I do want to pull in a question from the audience, uh, which is kind of along this theme and pulling things together. Uh, why does there appear to be uh, a large breakdown in the information disseminated between dispatchers, pilots, controllers, TMU, and command center? And so in the theme of every day is a training day, um, could you maybe um, provide a little context around that? I'll take that one a little bit. It's, there's a lot of information to disseminate to a lot of folks in a short period of time. Um, one of the things we, as traffic managers, we try to operate in the future. Uh, I always look in two hours out to three hours out, Jessica, even farther. Um, it's difficult to react when things are happening very last minute. But for instance, if we have a, uh, a typical weather situation, it's 
building up over the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's difficult to both get departures out of Washington area and into the Washington area because they're deviating in due to spotty thunderstorm activities. So one of the tactics we'll use is what's called a, 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 call it a, a, a tunnel route, where we'll keep the departures at 10,000 feet for 70 or 80 miles until they clear the arrivals. Well, that requires coordination with the TRACON, the tower, the frontline manager in the area. That frontline manager's got to go to tell the controller, who hopefully is not in the middle of a briefing. And then everybody's got to get, there's eight or 10 moving parts for one tool to get one piece of you know, operation moving. And it's, it, we're humans, things fall through the cracks. And we try every, you know, every, every, we use every method we can to not let that happen, but things just fall through the cracks. You have various levels of experience out on the floor. Um, there's times where you know, you're in a rough weather night, I'm calling out to an area, and perhaps you have a, a newer FLM or a CIC in place, and they're just not as, you know, don't have as much background or as much experience as somebody that was earlier in the day or another shift. So there's just a lot of challenges. It, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's very difficult to get all those moving parts coordinated at the same time. A lot of times airlines will call and say, hey, why, did the, why is this guy not going? Because maybe the tower uh, you know, things get chaotic at an airport. When, when airplanes, air, airplanes, you know, airports are designed to take airplanes in and spit them back out. When that happens, like, like Gerald says, it turns into a parking lot. Um, the tower controllers get really busy real quick, and now it's not difficult, it can be, uh, can be pretty easy to not lose an airplane, but to lose track of a couple airplanes, and I'll get a call from Mike or from Rachel and say, hey, my flight's sitting on the ground, why is it not moving? And I have a route available. Because not out of anybody try to do the wrong thing. Sometimes you just, it just becomes so chaotic, it's difficult to manage that. So you get that coordination piece. There's a lot of all those pieces, and things fall through the cracks occasionally. It's not necessarily an excuse. It's just how complex the system is. And Mother Nature does uh, not play well with the, with the NAS, as we all know. Mike, how about a, from a dispatcher perspective? Well, I, I mean, that's some really good points there. And, and, you know, the communication piece is a big one. And is there room for improvement? Absolutely. And I think um, when you look at all the things that are going on in next gen and, and all the new things, tools, and everything coming down the line, especially for the FAA, you know, I think industry, we have to figure out a way, how do we electronically communicate? So. You know, one good way is CPDLC, but that's not a mandate yet to have that on all the aircraft uh, operating in the U.S. I wish it were, because I think the folks from the ATC side of the equation understand the value and the importance of having CPDLC. But we've got some new software coming out, a airborne reroute tool, pre-departure reroute tool. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, look, we have to issue traffic management initiatives for the constraints in the airspace, but as those constraints move and maybe even dissipate, then we have to be able to react to that environment and say, how can I get back on a more advanced or better trajectory? So trajectory-based operations is coming, but if I want to share with the air traffic folks that this flight from Boston to Dallas that's over Dreyer, it was routed over Wichita because of a traffic management initiative instituted two hours ago, but now that weather has dissipated and I can get them back over an, a normal route. How am I going to do that? Mm. And it goes back to communication. How am I going to do that without picking up phones, without the traffic management unit that is handling that flight at the current time, calling two or three other TMUs to say, can we do this or not? So um, I think that's an area, uh, very good question. There is a lot of holes in that communication process today, and we definitely need to find ways to improve it which would then subsequently improve the safety part of the operation. I would say also that there's um, some things to be considered. Like you said, it's not always clear that aircraft have been rooted a certain way or kept at a certain altitude to assist with traffic management concerns. So sometimes you'll have a departure comes off Atlanta. He's only filed up to file 200, but he's a big heavy jet airliner. Why isn't he going all the way up to 30,000, 32,000, 36,000 feet while he's going down to Florida? And sometimes the reason for that is we were worried about that airspace, and so we kept them capped by the traffic management initiative. But the controllers wanted to be a nice person. Says, hey, why are you down there? Oh, I don't know. This is a pilot. And so next thing you know, they go ahead and climb them. You think you're doing the right thing. The pilot doesn't necessarily know what the traffic management reason was that they were be kept low. 
And down the line, we have volume concerns we're worried about for the high altitude sectors, and that was the reason. So it's kind of that capping and tunneling bin that you alluded to. The other thing is that there has never been a really clear way to distinguish who it is that should not be moved off their route. So when you're trying to save somebody some fuel and a pilot asks you for a shortcut and you give it or you know, something along the lines of the route just doesn't make sense, it's not normally what you see for the route, so you offer them you know, what would be considered normal route for you. They sometimes were on that route because it was a traffic management initiative to get them out of the way of a problem down line, maybe three centers away, maybe two areas away, but still we were trying to solve something. And one of the things we noticed was when we had ABRR and PDR, PDRR, so Airborne Reroutes and Pre-Departure Reroutes instituted and started working with ERAM, we suddenly noticed a very high increase in the amount of compliance we were getting on these routes. People weren't moving them off the routes because now you guys as controllers knew that there was a reason. You don't know what the reason is, but you know there's a little symbol in there now saying there's a TMI initiative associated with it. And it was very interesting to see that. Now, unfortunately, this year in swap season, that was turned off due to automation issues. And so we kind of haven't gotten there yet. But I think there's going to be a cultural shift to kind of realize a way for us to all realize when we're doing that kind of controller on controller crime. It's something you're doing to help someone up here, but someone down here is going to feel the pain later when they have too many airplanes that they weren't expecting. So it, it's hard to communicate that, like who, who you can give those reroutes to and be a nice guy to and who we really had there for a reason. And that's one of the difficulties of our system right now. Yeah, can I tag on that for a minute? I'm surprised you even brought up that thing with me around here, Jessica, <laughs> with altitudes. Um, great, great story. Um, so I'll just tell you from the industry side of the equation, whenever there are constraints in the, in the, air, the national airspace system, we understand we're going to lose capacity. I mean, that's a fact. The demand normally stays the same, but how do we shift that demand elsewhere to where you can manage it safely? That's the trick. So what we have seen, and especially down in Jacksonville Center, and what Jessica was mentioning here, is we sometimes file flight plans at a lower altitude to use airspace that's underutilized. And that's a key piece for industry. And you folks, but we don't have access to your map values. We don't have access to the sector loads. And so that's a missing piece for us. So my dispatchers, um, they dispatch according to the best winds, unless we tell the computer to do something else, to file a different route for weather or to um, maybe change the altitude to avoid some turbulence, things of that nature. So somehow we have to figure out how we can work together to communicate hey, airline, if you fly over here at this altitude, there's nobody else out there. You might not have that 40 miles in trail at 37,000 feet. So uh, it's a big discussion, big area for improvement, but it goes hand in hand with managing the NAS. So, you know, I, I thought long and hard about asking this question, but to go back to what Paul says, we don't hide from the truth here. We deal with real issues, right? So ATC is the ultimate team sport, right? We say that all the time. We all know the relationship between TMU and the operations is not great, and that's putting it nicely. No doubt there's unique relationship issues between the command center and other TMU units. So from the controllers on the board, is this a real thing? And if it is, how does, how does it look to you, and how do, we, how do you think we could fix it? So well, I think what I see, especially, uh, in my role as the uh, as an ATSAP uh, representative, doing ATSAP reports, um, it's actually the same reoccurring theme that we've heard up here. It's communication. The biggest problem, I say biggest problem, because there's so many when we're, we're talking about reporting on, on severe weather, but in this case, it, a lot of times there's a phenomenal plan put up at the command center. It's it's communicated to TMU, but it doesn't make it to the line controller. So the plan is for everybody to go left, and it's literally so simple that the controller, which by the way, you guys are the best weather controllers in the world. I just thought I needed to sneak that out there. But the plan is to go left, but the controller and the pilot decide to go right, so now the plan is no longer the plan. And, and it's that failure of communication from the line controller up and from all the way from the command center back to that controller, it's the breakdown of the communication that I've seen more times than not. 
So in the tower, it's a little bit unique and different because traffic management coordinators work alongside controllers. At least at JFK, there are former controllers who went into the TMU unit, but they, you know, it's only a 400 square foot tower cab, so they're working alongside you. They're filling in where they need to. And so when we talk about traffic management, yeah, they get all of the criticism when the you know what is in the fan and none of the praise when things are going well or fairly well, if you want to quantify that. But, you know, communication is key. There's a lot of human factors involved and personality relationships and how people like to work and what they feel comfortable doing and not doing. Um, I know it's a little bit different in the TRACON and Enroot environments in terms of their TMUs and the job and function they play and do. Um, but at least in the tower cab, I think TMs specifically have a empathy for what we do as controllers because one day they may be working in the TMU and then the next day they're working in the controller side. So they, you know, they have a good understanding of our roles, talking to pilots, making sure they're doing their jobs to help us and not hurt us. So from my perspective, I mean, I was a controller for 12 years. And during that time, I remember my only comments were for, regarding TMUs was, oh my God, how did they expect me to get that release integrated with this airborne stream I've already got? That was a horrible release, why did they do that? Or, I'm really busy, it's really complex, what did they do to help me? Because I don't think they did enough. You know, we've, Every one of you probably have had that same view because you've worked the traffic, you know what that is, you know where you can place some blame. Um, I went up to the traffic management unit at the center and I was there for two years and you hear the adage, you're gonna gain 20 pounds and lose 20 friends, because that's what you do in TMU. You're gonna eat at your desk, you're gonna work traffic nonstop, you're gonna take breaks to go to the bathroom, grab your food and come back on swap nights because you're gonna work nonstop, because that's how it is. And nobody's really gonna know what you did. I mean, I've always thought there needs a, there's a big PR problem in TMU. They don't know how many routes you put out, how many airplanes you have rerouted, or what you've done, because you guys deal with the end result of that product which is going to be they didn't move enough because they didn't have the ability to move enough or the weather grew more than they thought it would and they can't get enough out. Or you're chasing alerts because on nights where there's weather and there's deviations, every nine planes you move out, 15 more deviating around that weather right back into that same airspace. And it's, it's an interesting thing. It doesn't, you don't work side by side like you do in a tower when you're in a center. Um, you're in a separate area and so nobody really knows what has or has not happened on that night. Um, so I do think we, we do need to understand more of what we're doing. And I know that across the country, I think a lot of controllers that work in the centers aren't necessarily applying to be in the TMU anymore. So they're bringing them from outside. And I think there might be a lot of distrust there. Like how can they know what's going on in my airspace if they've never worked it? How can they know what I'm feeling over here as a controller because they've never even worked the west side or the east side or they've never done this. And that's, that's true, that's where it's on you to help have that communication with them to explain, this is why it was really difficult. That doesn't work for me when you do this or certain situations, because we really have to have a serious conversation of what needs to be done to fix the system. Because there's, there's perspectives involved that are different that we've got to come to the same conclusion and we've got to get to the same place on that of how to make it better, how to make it workable. Like I said, the whole goal is to give you a workable situation. It's not gonna be perfect. You're still going to have to move people. You're still going to have to vector people. You're still going to have to deal with uh, times when there's going to be, you're going to be really busy for 30, 45 minutes and it'll come back down. But hopefully they've done enough to give it to something you can be successful at and not something that's ridiculous. And I know there have been nights that have been ridiculous. This has been a long swap season. A lot of you have worked six day work weeks and had to come in and see it over and over again. So it definitely happens. But we've got to start having that conversation for real. And it can't just be a soup running down and yelling at the TMU. It needs to be a real conversation from professional colleagues to professional colleagues of what we can do to make it better. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good challenge. Um, some resources could assist. One of the things we do when we have new traffic managers come up to the unit is we have them go to the areas maybe they didn't work uh, in, try to get familiarization. Maybe they've never worked in the en route environment. So we try to send them out, get them en route, in, uh, get them some en route um, familiarization. We send them out to the towers. This is what a tower is. Go take a look. Of course, we send them to you know Dulles Tower, which is 30 miles away. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon. It's one o'clock. They get to see what a super's like. All that great stuff. We don't send them up there. It's 6:30 at night on a swap night when you've just closed the fourth fix and the airplane's just gotten the third reroute. And now and it's chaotic because we don't have the resources to let somebody go on a crappy night. They don't have the resources to let an en route controller come in and see what they're doing. 
So it would be nice if there were some, you know, to, on those nights where there's, where there's really a challenge, that's when you need that kind of cross pollinating, if you will. I can go to the tower to see what their life is like. They can come here and see what my life is like. You know, they're, we all have our own little fiefdoms. You know, for Gerald, his, his world stops pretty much past the end of the runway. For the Tracon controllers, their world stops at 45 or 50 miles, 10, 20, whatever, 1,000 feet. My world stops kind of at the end of my airspace, although I've done this long enough, I'm concerned with what New York's doing, I'm concerned with Cleveland and Chicago, or not Chicago, but you know my, my surrounding centers. Jessica's concerned with the rest of the NAS, and there's a lot of moving parts, and to have that, all those moving parts and everybody be on the same page at the same time is very, very challenging. It really is, uh, it's, it's just difficult. Hey, so, Jessica, on, along those lines of you know, trying to get different parties to uh, understand each other. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, we send our ATC coordinators to the command center to the 50113 class, and it's the best class I've ever had in my career. Outstanding. Do any of the, I don't know how it works for your, your side of the equation, but do any of the controllers get access to that, or do they have many 50113 classes at their local areas? or? So I believe it is still a requirement within like the first year of going to TMU and sometimes that has to be extended based on staffing um, for the TMCs to come up and experience the 50113 class. And it's basically an introduction to the ground delay programs, what kind of root structures we do, how we come up with those. And, and it's a good information. But controller wise, unless you're requesting to come to it, I, I don't know that regular controllers decide that they want to come or even know it exists. I mean, so. I, I don't think there's a lot of knowledge out there of what that is or what that does. So, so, so let's talk about safety a little bit and, and how weather impacts that. I know safety is uh, near and dear to my heart and, and everybody's in the, this room's uh, heart. Um, I think David and Rachel, you are both involved in voluntary safety reporting and other safety type activities. And you both have uh, extensive experience as an air traffic controller and as a pilot. Can you talk a little bit about what type of trends you're seeing around weather and, and as it applies to safety? You want to start? Sure. Uh, uh, the, uh, when, I, I, when I found out I was going to be on this panel, uh, one of the things I did was ask some of our ASAP analysts to pull reports for me. I, I got a year's worth, so I looked back a year from today to see, and then uh, in, in using keywords and whatnot, we, we kind of pulled out, teased out reports that were directly weather related. Um, the, uh, in, as far as weather and air traffic control, kind of sifting through those, looking through what types of reports we had, um, almost uh, the vast majority of them uh, were related to errors that pilots committed uh, when they were issued a reroute, whether that was in flight or on the ground. Uh, that also includes coded departure routes during swap events. So that was a big, uh, something that we had to work through this uh, summer with y'all, <laughs> it's been brutal. Um, Republic has a base at National, Philly, Newark, and LaGuardia, and we're getting ready to open up a Boston base. So this is something that is very near and dear to our hearts and something that we deal with every day and our dispatchers work with every day. And so, um, and, and those reroutes, what happens is that we have this thing in, in, on the pilot side called CAMI. Uh, which is an acronym that stands for Confirm, Activate, Monitor, and Intervene. That's when we're making FMS entries and we're changing our route or been given a descent clearance or whatever. It's an entry of something, whether it's a, the route or the altitude or, or whatever. And, um, and the, the, fail, the ASAPs that came in were primarily related to uh, they got the reroute or they were given a heading and they forgot to push the button, or they pushed the button but it didn't do what they expected it to do, or, or that type of thing. So those are the issues that we deal with uh, around, those kind of the root cause, and then that, that uh, leads to some of the other errors. So you know, we have something called threat and error management. Obviously on a, on a weather day, the weather's gonna be one of those threats that we're gonna be dealing with. It adds to the workload, it adds to the complexity. And when you talk about every day as a training day, for us, one of the things we fight as pilots is complacency. And on those days, you're not going to be very complacent because you're really working. We're all working a lot together and everything. So then it becomes ta task saturation. So now we have, now we've been given this reroute, but I'm also in the middle of deviating around this thunderstorm. You just asked me to go direct to this fix when able, and, and we think that we did that. But 
We've got, we're also, the flight attendant's called up. When is the turbulence going to end? The di we just got a message from dispatch that says, when do you think you're going to be able to turn towards the airport? There's all of those things are happening all at the same time, and that's where the, the majority of our reports come from for that. And then on the other side of that is the turbulence injuries that, that occur during some of those weather events as well. So from an ATSAP standpoint, what, what we see more times than not, and I'm going to sound redundant, but it really goes back to communication. Um, you read a report, it's a severe weather event, whether it's a, a front that's coming through or worse, convective activity where it's much more difficult to predict. Um, the, the reports that we get, uh, you know, sometimes they make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It's just terrible. Um, we're, we're trying to make it better. It's, it's work in progress. But insofar, the rest of the reporting, I mean, we, we get what everybody out here knows, and that's that when, when the weather picks up, uh, the frequency congestion is through the roof. Nobody's happy at the altitude they're at. Everybody wants to deviate. Um, since I work on the Eastern Service area, most of my en route facilities uh, touch the ocean, and in most cases, there's SUA airspace out there further compounding it, because now we have this line of weather coming through, and it's causing a, a choke point, a pinch, up against a, an SUA where the military or the user won't give it back to us. Uh, that's probably the, would cover the lion's share of en route and, and a large portion of the, the terminal reports that we get. So uh, to add to that, uh, you, you mentioned communication. That's another, uh, that's probably the second biggest uh, ASAP source that we get is a miscommunication between the pilot and the controller. And sometimes it has to do with expectation bias. We think you mean us to do one thing. Right. We hear, we hear what we were expecting to hear, not what you actually said, that kind of thing. So the, uh, you know, for us, uh, in order to be excellent every day is to listen and actually hear what's being said. That, those two things don't always happen. And so that's something that we as pilots have to do is uh, make sure that we are continually paying attention to uh, what's going on, the situational awareness uh, piece of it. So, and that includes the controller. That also includes um, getting the information from the controller that's important for me to complete my flight safely. So the, the uh, PIREPs, PIREPs are very important. On our side, we encourage you know, giving them continuously, and, and, and controllers are very good about soliciting them. But sometimes that information doesn't get shared you know, back to us either. Maybe they just said it, and then I check in, so I missed out you know, on what just got said. So you know, that's the other piece of it, is the, the communication piece between the two of us as well. And, and just to piggyback on that, so, so many times, because of the frequency, frequency congestion, but, uh, <coughs> all, all the other things that we're having to deal with on the class, the, the communication that I was speaking to before was you know, from the bottom up and, and, and back up, or back to the bottom. But a lot of times, the issue is simply that I didn't communicate where I think you should go or, or what I'm seeing, or you didn't clearly communicate exactly what you're gonna do, and, and just the pilot controller communication, or lack thereof, results in an event where, uh, or at least a safety issue, where someone feels the need to file a report. Please file reports. You can't file enough of them. There's, um, you know, sometimes as controllers, <coughs> we've worked a sector for five years or 10 years or 15 years, and we forget the person at the other end of that frequency might be their first time through this airspace. Yep. Um, There's another kind of silent impact out there. You know, when I started 32 years ago, um, pilots still dialed in a VOR, identified it, tuned the radio, flew it. When you rerouted somebody, you could say, you know, clear direct Charleston, Jet 79, Kennedy, and whatever arrival into Boston. They spoke that language. Today, they don't speak that language. For most of you in the NAS, you realize the VORs are rapidly disappearing and not working anymore. Uh, and now there's lots, of, there's lots of great tools out there. There's lots of great waypoints and fixes and Q routes and T routes and all these wonderful things. But that's far more challenging when you have to do that on the fly rather than pre-plan. And, you know, she, on the ground, when, uh, you know, Rachel's typing in the route. The, no, nobody's moving. Every, everything's happy. She can check it and recheck it. It's good. But when you're in the air at 35,000 feet and now somebody's giving you a reroute and you have to phonetically spell out six fixes verbally and then get a read back. And hopefully somebody doesn't break into that read back so you have to get a second time or a third time. There are some emerging technologies that will help with that, but they are still not there. 
Um, Datacom is still not there. Uh, the ABRR is still not quite there. So those are big challenges, too, that aren't necessarily weather-related, but are compounded when we have weather events. All right, let's go to some questions uh, from the audience. <clears throat> Jessica, you seem very yes. popular. You're very let's, popular. Let's go. Let's go. You're very popular. This is good because very we can popular. kind of figure that. It's not magic, and we can't come up with an exact, right. accurate solution every time. Let's go with the top one. Why does TMU slash headquarters issue, Terry, that's for you, headquarters, uh, issue reroute <laughs> initiatives that are near or through the weather that everyone is deviating around? Okay, and so obviously that, that joke was that it's command center that's actually doing this on the side. But um, So basically what we're doing is, like I talked about at the beginning of the day, our goal is to put those transcon routes, because of the complexity, like you just spoke of, of trying to do those reroutes airborne, it's ridiculous. So we're trying to put them into clear air. Some days, there's no clear air anywhere. They've done that forecast. They've gotten there, and I'm not trying to bark up the tree of the, of the National Weather Service, but I mean, they get their grounds out and it's drawn all over the country. And so we start asking a lot of questions. Where is it gonna be most permeable? Where are we gonna be able to get through this weather? Where's our best chances? And that's what we're going on. Our goal at that point is to give you some structure so you have routes out there where the airplanes are coming to you in a straight line, where the traffic management can use mile and trail to space them out if they need to. And when you get them, we can reduce complexity of them coming at you, deviating from all sorts of directions, that there's major flows that are in a straight line so you can daisy chain them around and reduce that complexity. Um, our goal is to not put planes through weather when we can, but weather changes, weather moves, the forecast doesn't necessarily hit where we thought it was going to, and on days like that, we're doing reroutes. We're trying to put in new reroutes to change that. So maybe we had a route structure that was here, and now we're going to try to put them here. But some of those are already airborne now that are on the old one, and so it's tactically trying to move them in the air. And I know that's complicated and complex. It's just a matter of we try to mitigate as many of those variables as we can and pin them down. But some days, you, no matter what you do, things just keep moving and changing. So Mike, any comment on that? From, from your side of the house, especially when it comes to TMIs and initiatives and... Yeah, well, they don't like to hear from us because what that nice route that Jessica just built that made a lot of sense, I don't have the fuel capacity for my aircraft to fly that route because it adds 30 or 40 minutes. So those are challenges. We understand the need for them, but then occasionally the good part about that is, is that we have the ability to communicate with the command center to say, this is a problem. Can we make one exception? So, and that's what we do. And so that's the key piece to it is that I think we collaborate and work together to mitigate some of the issues that uh, end up being a result of the constraint in the NAS. Okay. And I think it works pretty well, don't you, Jess? So Mike, as long as you're talking, let's go to the next question because this is a good one for you, I think. <laughs> oh. Why is the responsibility on the FAA to review aircraft instead of the airline following a route around the predicted weather? Well, I'll put uh, my dispatcher hat on, and um, I would have to say that virtually all of our dispatchers would like to just be able to file a route that they think appears to avoid severe weather, uh, severe areas of thunderstorms, because that's what the FARs dictate that they do. But we also understand and we're teaching the importance of traffic flow management, and I think that's the key piece. So it's easy for me to file this route this way, but traffic managers may not like that and it's obviously been proven that sometimes they don't like that but you know in a perfect world could we do that or would we like to do that I would have to say yes most dispatchers would like to do that but I also understand that there's only so much capacity and you have to weigh that capacity demand balance and figure out what's best for the for the NAS not necessarily what's best for, for me as the dispatcher. Yeah. So I want to address this a couple of ways if I can. Um, I ask this question a lot. I ask this question to the airlines a lot. Because if that was the case and they filed around weather, then I would just be looking for where the volume issues are and then trying to just mitigate volume concerns because they'd be away from the weather. Um, a couple of the things that you have to understand about our system. Okay, so the way that it has to build, you know, those, you guys have all seen the monitor alert parameters, those map numbers for your sector that are coming through. Basically, those are built based on historical data. The computer has to come up with an idea, a projected amount of volume that's coming through your airspace. So it says, where did that plane fly from DCA to Las Vegas 51% of the time over the last 14 days? Okay? 
and it goes through and says, okay, he flew through this sector, this sector, this sector, this sector, this sector. We'll give him each account on the projected time based on departure time and that when they're gonna be in that sector, okay? So it's historical data. We don't really get updated data until the dispatchers file their flight plans about 90 minutes prior to flight. And then we get an update and says, oh no, they're not going that way. They don't like it up there, they're coming down here. And so you see those map numbers change, especially if you're kind of in the center somewhere, if you're not an origin or destination point where it has limited choices of where to fly, if you've got all the room through the Midwest to go either through Mini or through Kansas or maybe coming down through Fort Worth, that can change and that can go around. So a lot of times we're waiting on that data from the airlines, but we can't wait long enough to, to just two hours prior to departure to figure out if they're gonna file around that weather. There's a trust issue here because I've got to actually make some decisions to guarantee that they're in a good spot and they're gonna be away from it. So we're looking at where's the jet stream, where have they been filing for the day so far, because human nature is if they found a route that's good, they're probably gonna stick with that route. So we're kind of looking at the trends of what they've been filing, trying to make other predictions besides just using historical data of where they flew in the past when there wasn't weather in that area. And that, I think that's one of the disadvantages of our system right now is it's not very robust or dynamic. It doesn't give us really good data on where these guys are flying, so we have to make projections. So sometimes they did file away from the problem and I went ahead and put a route out anyway because I can't take the risk of them filing what the system's telling me it's going and what areas it's telling me it's going through. So that's, that's one of the things that has to be considered as we update our technology and go through is how do we get to this point where we actually see what they're really filing on a real-time basis rather than waiting for them to send a proposal out and figure out from there what we're looking at for numbers. So sometimes they did file away from it and we put out a route anyway because we can't take the risk of them not filing away from the weather. Sometimes though, I've had conversations with airlines, I will tell you it wasn't American, that told me we, our dispatchers just file the optimal route no matter what because that's gonna be the shortest, best flight route and then we expect ATC, air traffic, FAA to take care of it and tell us where to go. And my mouth just drops, are you serious? Like you have regulations, there are, there are requirements between the dispatcher certification and the, and the pilot in command to make sure that they don't file near weather. So I think there is a culture shift that has happened within the airlines themselves as well. I think there are staffing concerns everywhere. <laughs> so I think the airlines have staffing concerns, I think the facilities have staffing concerns and I think that works to where we have a lot of people with a younger group coming in that are trying to figure out how to kind of work in this culture where there's not enough people to do as much as needs to be done to make it as robust as it needs to be at this point. Yeah, and I think on our side, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we don't have access to some of that information that might make us make better decisions that work with traffic management. That is the sector loads, um, the map values, uh, that type of stuff. And so, I don't know, maybe we can bridge that somewhere in the future with technology, like you say, Jess. So, so to kind of roll on to the next question, which kind of falls along this line, when the plan that TMU comes up with ends up not working for both the pilot and or the controller, how could that information be sent back up the chain more efficiently so a new plan could be constructed? So that relies directly on your relationship with your traffic management. The sooner you can tell them something's not working, the sooner they can tell us something's not working and we can try to turn off one of those faucets of traffic and help you out. Um, the traffic management units themselves have certain abilities to start doing that. If you have a major airport in your facility, then you could go ahead and go into a ground stop or start doing something to try to help out in that way to start reducing the volume in that area. And, and make that a little bit better. At the command center level, we're gonna start trying to do tactical reroutes, calling and asking other facilities to do airborne reroutes to get them out of the way of the problem. But it, it really goes back to the better the communication is at the facility with the traffic management, the quicker these things can be fixed. Um, that's basically what we really need to do is figure out a way to make that better, that whole process. Yeah, one little add on to that too, is there is an element of trust when we communicate with one another. Um, if I'm it, most of the time when I'm picking up the phone and talking to the command center, I've been doing it long enough, most of the people recognize my voice, uh, recognize my voice. and they'll trust what I'm going to tell them, and they'll, I can usually get buy-in. But there's times if you have a new person, I could be throwing five or six years of experience at a problem and saying this is really going to work, and this person doesn't have that trust or doesn't have that, they had a bad situation, whatever it may be, and they're not going to go along with it, so the plan fails or you, or you end up not coming up so it, it's and it's it's 
it's all of us trusting one another. And, and that comes with experience and communication. Events like this are terrific because I was telling Jessica before, I said we can put faces and names together. And when you, when you do that, you build trust amongst one another. And when you have you know, that rapport with a controller at a tower, a controller at a Tracon or another facility, um, you know, case in point, uh, we'll have weather in Pennsylvania. That never happens. Um, can't get out of New York westbound. They come down through the GDC. Map numbers start blowing up. First thing, Indy starts freaking out because their sector is getting red. Well, a lot of times, what I'll do is preempt that and pick up the phone and say, hey, Indy, this is what's going on. We're moving this stuff out of New York your way. This is what I'm going to do to help you so you don't have to react when this plan. So instead of letting the plan go bad and not working, Again, where experience and trust comes in, I'll pick up the phone and say, these are the things I'd like to do to mitigate your fears and mitigate your constraints and get them going ahead of time. And that's, that, that's difficult to do when you don't have that trust factor between those TMU units and those facilities. So Ben has a good point, because when I get a phone call at command center from facility, I'm going to ask them a lot of questions, because I'm not going to immediately go into a route, because it might not necessarily be the right thing to do for the NAS. Um, I'm going to give an example. I'm not trying to pick on anyone. But there was a new TMC at a facility, and this is going to be a reference to Detroit. There was already weather affecting Detroit arrivals. There was only two ways in, one from the west and one from the east. And the you know, at Indy Center, this new TMC called, and they said, hey, I need to shut down the Detroit flow. And I said, why do you need to shut down the Detroit flow? I don't know. Hold on. And he called back, and he said, OK, the, the east sectors are being really busy right now. We need to stop the volume, so we need to shut down each flow. And I said, okay, if you shut down the, east, the, the last flow into Detroit through you, I've got one way in coming from the west. Every single flight going to Detroit is going to have to come in through Chicago soon through the west. There's people that aren't going to have enough fuel to make that flight. There's going to be a lot of complexity. If your issue is east coast sectors, can we shut down something different? Can we change volume in another area to fix this rather than eclipsing Detroit to where they can't get in anymore from that angle? Because it wasn't a matter of the flow to Detroit that was the problem. It was just that when they got busy, their first thing to do is shut off a major airport, which I kind of told you was one of their options earlier, and to stop the flow to Detroit, because they'll stop a lot of volume quickly. But in this case, Detroit was already so constrained for their arrivals coming in that if you did that, there was only one way in coming all the way, the Chamber of Commerce reroute, to get all the way around to it. It wasn't the right solution. So I'm going to ask a lot of questions. You know, what have you already done? Have you capped? Have you tunneled? Have you, you know, basically started some internal ground stops? Or what do we need to do to get there? So we are going to ask that because sometimes they don't have as much experience as Ben does, and they're new, and they're just starting, and they're wanting to do a really good job, and they want to make sure that they do a good job representing you and stopping the traffic. But sometimes that's too big of a move, and, or there's something else we can do that's a better option. So as you say, the trust factor thing, I think, it's both sides. We've got new people at Command Center that may not know exactly what they need to do in that moment. They're relying on you. But on the other side, we need the people that are in the TMUs to know where they are. You are absolutely the traffic manager at the facilities, are the subject matter experts of your airspace. And just like he talked about earlier, when we start talking about military and whether it's Sea Lord or tail hooks or something going active, and now you can no longer deviate out right. there in the ocean, you've got constrained airspace. We're pushing stuff inland. Now we're going to have volume concerns along the East Coast inland on Jet 121, Jet 75. So we're going to probably push something through Atlanta to help. And it's a domino effect. So before we start that first thing that's going to cause that domino effect, I've got to make sure that that's really needed. And we go the next step. But there, there is a trust. And there is open communication that has to take place. Yeah. And that's, that's challenging. Uh, after a summer like this, when it's the fourth or fifth swap night in a row, and you're tired, oh, and your you're passions tired. are running high, and trust tends to trickle down a little bit, and you know you have a controller come up from the floor with a little passion in their expression and want to know why they're getting beat up the fourth night in a row or the fifth night in a row. Um, you guys, your pilots get tired. You've got one flight, one airplane to deal with, but our controllers, this is four or five nights in a row. Gerald's getting tired of four or five nights in a row having three departure fixes shut down and tell, you know, I got a route, nothing available. I got a route, nothing available. Or, or there's just, it's just that exhaustion factor kicks in, which is, which is we're human. We, we can only, we're not superheroes. We're not, you can't fix every problem. So sometimes that just being tired has a big impact on the system. And, and Jim, maybe just share and pull the thread all the way through. Um, every day, uh, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer Tim Morell and the Vice Presidents Jeffrey Vincent and the Vice President of System Operations Mike Artis sit down and look at the previous day operation. And so if a plan didn't go well, 
kind of on a, a, a larger or national scale. They have a really frank conversation about that. They look at delays, they look at customer comments, and, and they'll go back and actually learn or go back and, and bring lessons learned back to the table and then share that information out. And so there is a process for that to work all the way from the field facility perspective, all the way up to the various highest levels in our organization. But as I think you can hear a common theme here, communication is the key. And I think it's very important that if you have concerns at the local level, you, you have a local conversation and, and try to work through those concerns. And if not, then you raise them up to the command center and work through that. And just like they said earlier that ASAPs are really important, traffic management reviews are important. Like we really do want to figure out you know, where it is that we're lacking or what we need to do or change. And just like anything in the FAA, it's a glacial change. It's slow, it takes time, it takes a lot of repetition before you change something that has worked in the past. But we use those traffic management reviews to try to figure out what it is we can improve. I think one of the things is it's easy to Monday morning quarterback and know exactly where the weather was, so why didn't you do these routes? The thing you got to put yourself in the shoes of the person that was making decisions with what information they had at the time. Because in the end, we're trying to basically stuff your parachute. We're the ones doing that, just like Gordon Graham had said earlier. We're the ones trying to set it up so you've got something you can work through. And if we miss that, then something changed or we couldn't get to it the right amount of time or something is different or we're missing something on a regular basis that we don't know is a problem and we need that brought to our attention so that we can start correcting that. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how the next question got posted by a guy who's on the panel. It's kind of weird. I didn't see you pull your phone out at all, Dave, but why does it seem like there's a lack of support from the command center when weather is severely impacting the southeast? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a minute to think of that. <laughs> yes, guess so. Okay. Well, go ahead. Okay. It's so, four years anyway. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, that's interesting, the question. I would say that part of that is going to be the fact that, Jack, I'm assuming this is Jacksonville Miami Center, okay, just because of the way it's asked and the way the question's there. Maybe Houston Center as well, but I'm thinking Jacksonville Miami. A lot of times, because there are overflights that go international to the Caribbean, but a lot of those flights that are in there that are coming through Miami and Jacksonville Center, you're at an end point or a beginning point. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that with your structure and your airspace, you're going to depart, however, like if you're coming out of Miami and there's weather in Jacks, you're going to depart out of Jackson or out of Miami going to Jacksonville, and you communicate very clearly with each other between Jackson and Miami about where you want those planes and if they're going to recover quickly. If it doesn't really go beyond Jackson, Miami's weather up into Wash and that, um, and two or three tiers out, Jackson and Miami have a really good job of communicating with each other to where to put those airplanes. Now, if it's, if it's all the way up to New York and Wash and Boston that need to be impacted and we're more than one facility away, then we're going to do a lot there. But if a lot of it's internal, traditionally, that is how we have handled that. Now, the, when you're at that point and you're trying to figure out where to put roots and root structure, you've got limited root structure available going through those airspaces. So really, that starts to become questions of whether or not we use an airspace flow program to give edicts to try to slow the volume down because we really don't have a lot of root options to fix the root options. That's something you guys tend to handle tactically. I think that's how I would kind of address that right now. That's the reality of what we're doing at this point. So I see a lot of other pieces that, that I think uh, lead this belief of there's a lack of support from the command center. Uh, a lot of it's driven from the facility. It, the, the command center gets blamed because it's easy. But, but the truth of the matter is you work in a sector, your map number, your monitor alert, uh, parameter is 21, except half of your sector's weather and everybody's deviating, your facility should go in and adjust that map number because they get that information. So if that number doesn't go in and get adjusted, it's the facility's fault because now the command center doesn't have that information to draw on. Right? Again, it, it seems like everything we're talking about goes back to communication. Yeah, it's been a lifelong problem, hasn't it? And I, I would, oh, go ahead. We're, we got just a couple minutes left, so we got a couple, couple. Let's go lightning round with a couple of questions right here. What do you think? Um, now that calling weather is a duty priority, how does the command center quantify the extra workload to make sure that in route sectors are not becoming overloaded, or do you? We do not. Um, when I was a controller, it was a duty priority at that time. I don't know that it's changed, um, and so calling weather was always a. And, I'm saying that six years ago is when I was last talked to my last airplane as a controller. So it's been a while for 10 years prior to that. Um, but we don't take that into consideration. Um, we do take map values into consideration. 
I do think one of the issues we have right now is different interpretations of what those map numbers mean. If we're all using the same tool and we have two different entities interpreting those results differently. Right. For example, in traffic management, we use, sorry about that, the 7210.3 chapter 18, and it's the guideline and all the regulations associated with it. And it says, if you're gonna go red, the traffic management unit's gonna look at it, they're gonna call down to this area, ask if they're okay. The soup's gonna look at it and say, yeah, we're good, we're putting a D side or a H you know, side in right now, depending on what you call it. Or no, we need you to move some planes, that team you will then move planes. You know, so we look at those map values to figure out if we're gonna have an issue. Um, it's a range. It's when you stop doing the workload permitted duties, that sort of thing. From what we understand is there's a growing safety concern that you should never go red with those map numbers. If, there, if one side is saying you should never go red, the other side is saying absolutely, because I look at them every day and say you can go red as long as it's for a short amount of time, it's not very many over. I analyze the time in sector and I'm like, hey, out of that 15 minutes, it's only three minutes. You know, it's, it's good, I'm not gonna worry about you and your TMU is doing the same thing. That's two completely different interpretations of the exact same tool. There's gonna be animosity as that happens. And the TMU is gonna be caught right in the middle of don't ever go red or you know, you, this is what your regulations actually say. So I think it's important to have that frank discussion of what that really means. So can I add one little communication piece onto that? I wore a headset for 26 years. For those 26 years, every time a 71.10.65 change came out, I read it, I applied the changes, I went on to my next day. When I became a traffic management coordinator, I no longer had to stay current on the boards. I stayed current in the TMU. The 71 ton took a much smaller role in my day-to-day -day operation. 72 ton made a much larger role. So now when there's big impactful changes on the air traffic controller side, we don't always get that information as clearly or as loudly, loudly as we should. And that's a perfect example of where weather calling used to be a, you know, if you had time, now it is required. It is a mandatory duty. So it, it, we don't always get that information and we're still supporting the folks on the floor that wear the headsets and just that communication piece just not that anybody wanted it to, but I think sometimes things fall through the cracks. Excellent. So we are all out of time. If you would just thank these panelists for their uh, efforts today. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Come on.